Welcome to the Sleeping Barber Podcast. V, guess what? What? I had a shower today. <laughs> That's incredible, man. That's something to celebrate with all with our entire audience. Well, I combed my hair. Well, I didn't, but. <laughs> Well, the backstory, you know this because we're both living in Calgary, but for the backstory for you, listener, uh, Calgary had a water main break, and for the last, like, week, we've been on water rations. That's true. Whereas, like, we may actually run out of water is what they're talking about. I brought home, like, a flat of six-liter bottles, jugs from Montana last weekend. Just in case. Yeah. Well, it it is a real thing, and I know I'm half joking here celebrating a shower but like yeah our shower time has kind of gone down yeah because of the rationing so um, i think a lot of people are spending more time at home not really leaving the house yeah yeah <laughs> you know what that also makes me think of I, i'd love to see how you make this connection but go shampoo ahead. <laughs> shampoo yeah it's okay and packaging and packaging yeah there it is i love it okay <laughs> The long-winded way to get there, but we got there. We got uh, there. Yeah. So Ella was awesome. I really enjoyed that conversation. Incredible. Yeah. Incredible. It's funny because we started out, it was like kind of casual. And then honestly, I think I had a similar thing with Ari too. I don't know if it's yeah. because I just see packaging all the time. I'm like, oh, I get it. But like, no, I don't. Nope. <laughs> <There's>, <laughs> I mean, I get, I get it. I know enough to know that I need to know more uh yeah. she was awesome and i was just sitting there talking about ice cream yeah yeah talking about ice cream for the whole the whole the whole thing but like it, that was such a really really interesting example to showing like how the consistency lacks for something very similar from the same brand and mm-hmm. anyways you're 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 100 percent right ella was incredible i have two almost three pages of notes as i was feverishly trying to jot down as much as possible even though retrospectively i can always go back to the to the audio but it's just in the moment i don't know for me there was a lot of light bulb moments and i generally appreciated uh her insights Mm -hmm. what what was like one of the ones that stuck out for you this may not mean a lot to anyone else but just a clear definition between being data-driven and evidence-based yeah like i it's very simple but i don't think anyone really thinks about it sorry i have never really thought about it this way if i'm being Mm. honest right being data driven you know being more a snapshot in the moment short term directional whatever whereas evidence base is how do you create things for the long term and they're somewhat repeatable and that's why i love the science element of this is like Mm -hmm. the law of gravity suggests every time you throw a ball from this height Mm will always fall at this speed that Mm -hmm. doesn't change Mm -hmm. So what kind of science can we apply as well to our methodologies? And I feel like that's where we, being more evidence-based can help us do that. So I really love the delineation or the the two descriptors there to kind of think about them differently because I'm going to bet you most marketers out there use data-driven as evidence-based and that's not the case. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that for sure. I, I think that's a, um, and, and I, I thought that the, her description of data versus evidence was great too. Like I, I also took a note about that one. Um, yeah, I, and I think I mentioned this in the thing about blood pressure, like having a high blood pressure reading is data. What I, yeah. per, what I get prescribed by my physician is evidence Yeah, that's because of too. the product that has the you know, has been indicated based on studies in this kind of population that shows that without a doubt, it doesn't do harm and it does benefit for this kind of person. That's that to me is like such a great defining thing between those two. Because, And I also agree with you. Like, I really do think a lot of people, well, everybody says data driven, you have to be data driven. You should be which evidence is, based. Which, yeah, they're different. Yeah. Like they're di- if you're talking about making long-term decisions, I'd rather be evidence-based on those rather than data that may or may not be right. And, you know, it gives you an answer for right now, but maybe not right forever. Like it's, yeah. I, I don't know, man. It, like, like I said, maybe everyone else listening has been, oh no, that's just, that's just 
yeah, obviously, but for me, it wasn't obvious. Um, Mm -hmm. I I don't think I ever thought about them that way. And it's maybe because of the nature of of my personal role where I've always been closer to data sets that are kind of show again, I always knew it wasn't a long-term way to to look at these data sets. It's always like in the moment. But when I think of the way stakeholders interact with me, it's always a snapshot right now directionally and things to that effect. So, so you've said this a few times in the last couple of episodes about your (laughs) reformed performance market performer. What's going on with you? I hardly knew you anymore, man. (laughs) (laughs) I think it just comes down to less, less and less trust in a lot of the, the algorithms and what they're doing for, for us. Mm. And the, the over, correction on the personalization projects and things like trying to get to that one-to-one communication. I think that for me, there, I had an aha moment. I want to say almost five years ago, but like, wait a second, mm-hmm. this can't be the path because we're really reducing our ability to target large audiences, right? We only have, we only have what we have. And I think you've heard me use the, the analogy of a, of an apple tree, right? Like when I think of an apple tree, it has, it produced so many apples, the apples will fall down on the ground. That is like your, performance marketing. It's picking up the intent that's already there for you. But mm-hmm. if you want to produce more apples, you have to nourish the soil. You have to, you know, add fertilizer, water mm-hmm. the apple tree and things to that effect. Plant and a that's few new seeds I, and all that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's what we often missed going down this. In, and don't get me wrong. Like I love a lot of the technology that we have at our, at our, um, at our fingertips, but I think it doesn't solve the problem of incrementality mm. and that should be the game growth mm-hmm. and incrementality to really say this investment transfer translated to this outcome. And if we hadn't made this investment, then we wouldn't have had this. Mm-hmm. I think that's the power that I'm really trying to uh, personally, you know, change internally at, at my mm-hmm. area of work, but just the way I think as well. So yeah, I am a reformed performance marketer. I wish I could put that in my title. People <laughs> internally, they do double takes every time they hear me speak. They're like, really? who are you? Yeah. Yeah. Like, right. You don't want more money in search? Like, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting. I, it, it, as you were saying that, I, I think Andrew Tyndall, when we just had him on, mentioned something oh, right. about him, him betting his career on the things that aren't changing. And like, yeah. hats off to anybody that wants to spend the game or spend their time in the game of like constantly changing, yeah. you know, depending on which way the wind blows. Um, Really? But yeah, that was fascinating. And kind of speaking to the data driven versus evidence based as well. Yeah. 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 I'm a new person. That's crazy. I've seen the light. Yeah. But I but I think it's interesting because um for a lot of reasons, but like I feel like over the period of this podcast that we've been doing, it's almost like happening in front of me in a weird way. <laughs> like, cause totally. there's bits and pieces where I'm like, Oh yeah. You said like, you know, you reference something. <laughs> I'm like, huh. And then more recently, I feel like you've just, I don't know. I had this just like, it. yeah, it's, it's funny. It's great. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. <laughs> no, that's great. Uh, okay. One other thing I had from Ella or, well, there's a lot of things, but one there's thing I had from Ella. Yeah. Um, I thought this was really interesting. I don't know if this is exactly what her quote was, but Mm. it's what I wrote down. It's not about how effective the distinctive brand assets are. It's how they trigger memory. Yes. So I may have butchered that a little bit because probably an effective distinctive brand asset is, is one that triggers memory, but yeah, that's ultimately not about what you think it is. It's what, about what it does. Yeah. I brought, I wrote that down as mental shortcuts, right? Right. And, and yeah, you're a hundred percent right. And I think that's again, where it's like, and I think she talked about this and I, I may get this wrong as well, but you know, the connection between mental and physical availability actually becomes the packaging, mm-hmm. right? Which helps again with those memories, if you will, but it's also using them in the context of, you know, uh, what did she call them? Boundaries of tinkering. I think it was. Oh yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. And I just see those things like really playing together uh, at the end of the day. Cause like, as you tinker with those boundaries, that's where you start really creating some of those memorable connections. Um, mm-hmm. But again, it could be rooted really into the packaging. I know we went down a rabbit hole. We probably spent way more time than we should have talking about colors, talking about the ice cream, but 
I don't know, man. Like for me, it was a huge, again, revelation, call it light bulb moment. Like I've mm -hmm. never thought about packaging having that significant of an impact. Me neither. In the way we think about them. I mean, the way like, we think of our brand. Yeah. I know you and I have had conversations about like things that have blown up, like Tropicana as an example. Yes. Um, and that's an obvious one where you go, okay, well, like that's a big deal. They changed the packaging sales tank. Um, but yeah, as we were prepping for this one, I literally went to, because it's getting hot outside now, I literally went to the grocery store and then I was looking for, um, lactose free stuff. And then I happened to notice that there's like three different colors. I'm like, huh, yeah. I gotta ask Ella about this. Cause this is the weird, like, I think this is what she does. And, and it like, I saw a whole new world opening up in front of me. I'm like, weird. I did never noticed all these ones and all these ones in like, right. You know? like pie crust made of lard instead of like vegetable and you know, all that kind of stuff. Daya cheese or not real cheese on pizza. Yeah. And there's yeah. all kinds of packaging variants that when you look at it, you're like, yeah, that doesn't look the same. It's not the same brand. Yeah. And I think the Hagen dazs example, like you had the plant free, the three examples was plant free, dairy free, and then just the normal. And you, when you looked at the dairy free, packaging and the um forgive me the the, the normal the normal yeah. one you can see consistency you could you could say you know that's hagen dazs and i think i, I in, in the episode i kind of used like the the thumb example like if i were to yeah, hide yeah, the logo yeah. does it still right yeah. but then you look at the plant-based plant -based one, one you hide the logo that could be like freaking activia or could yeah. be anything really yeah. and it really loses out in that in that sense of again the consistency that you've seen in other products so like why that departure and i know she talked about green has primarily been used to showcase something that is plant-based but then we sure. use the example with gum and she used she mentioned the color yellow, yellow i think yeah for tropical but it's like it's not usually what people associate with tropical so why yeah. why yellow yeah. So I then for me again, it's like why? Well, I guess I could see why green for plant, but for plant based, but I don't know. Just yeah. maybe, maybe it's a head scratcher. Yeah. But yeah, and then the oh, and that was the other one too. When you're talking about all the brands that those, well, let's just say you're a brand manager for Hagen does. The three mm -hmm. brands um, mean three different products and three different ways to support them because they're each totally different. And so now you've got to think about rather than having one campaign for all yeah. as, as an efficient campaign, you've got now three different things that you have to promote separately because they're three different, they look different. Yeah. And she, she brought up the example is if lit, maybe your lid becomes a differentiator, but everything else is consistent. So maybe it's a green lid, mm -hmm. but everything else is still consistent. Right. So then you can mm -hmm. still maintain some of that consistency across every product that you have. But we also know like these large organizations, they usually what happens is you have a different team that's working on the plant based stuff, a different team that's working on the non dairy and a different team that's working on, say, you mm -hmm. know, the, the normal project. They're rarely all the, around. They're all the same yeah. team, especially at the global level. So then that's where you can start seeping some of that seeing, sorry, uh, some of the the siloness of some organizations that yeah. creeps through and say, no, this is what matters. But I did want to quickly add to that. And I think this was a really, really interesting point where research becomes, I've never heard of research before. Have you heard of research? I know Ella brought it up a lot on the podcast. Yeah, She kept talking about this thing. I'm like research. What is this research? What is this stuff? <laughs> but she said, understanding what assets trigger category buyers. Right. Or in, category triggers, if you will. And I think category entry points, all, all that, I, th I see that as kind of the same thing. And it's stop making your own, what did she say? Stop making your own. I can't make up my own writing. That's, <laughs> that's embarrassing. <laughs> I think it, what it was just like, don't, don't stand in your own way, essentially, where you're, you're, you want to make sure if you have research to back up, you know, what assets actually trigger specific behaviors, make sure you're yeah. leaning into that. And how does that permutate things like the packaging? Anyways. Yeah. Yeah. On a related note, I had one on my sheet about investing in new packaging or a new asset. 
So, mm. you know, we're talking mm. tons about ice cream right now, but it, it's an interesting, <laughs> it's an interesting one. Cause it's like, that's just such a specific example. So yes, you can have the green lid on the haagen plant-based one You can, and color that doesn't look like haagen You can yeah. have the, I think it was a gold lid for lactose free and then the maroon lid for the regular one. Yeah. So you can do that or you could have a character or something along those lines that makes it unique. And so you're investing in that asset that then can live across different platforms instead of it being the packaging itself that has to be totally different. Yeah. Yeah. And it, 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 it ties perfectly into another thing that she said was just to make sure you're consistently adding to the palette versus always looking to refresh. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think we, we were talking about how marketers sometimes will come in, they'll do brand refreshes, logo refreshes, mm -hmm. let's point the brand in a different direction. It's, it's less about that. It's more about, well, what can you add to your brand palette sure. instead? Okay. Here's another thing. Here we go. <laughs> Because you can do that, but then you also would want to have collaboration, more collaboration between the product packaging team and the marketing team. Because mm. the marketing team could come up with all kinds of stuff because we have sort of infinite amount of inventory. Um, but if it doesn't fit on the package, then that might provide your constraint in which you have to yeah. like work in that side of that box because it's the stuff that's on the package that needs to be in the ad. Totally, totally. Yeah. See, see all the light bulb moments, man. I know. Like, we're just talking about packaging. I know. Yeah, it was great. Right. The one thing I want to end on is, and I think I got this quote correct because I, I think I did. Anyways, your strategy can't be based on differentiation. Your competitors will catch up. Mm. I love that line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a good one too. And I think you brought up the Tesla one as an example. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good, it's a great example. I mean, look where they're at today. Every brand, I mean, point, I think they're still the market leader and all that kind of stuff in North America, not globally. China's got BYD. I don't know how you pronounce that, but that's the largest EV manufacturer in the world. But a lot of other brands are catching up and Tesla's not doing any favors for, to themselves with the Cybertruck and things like that. So, uh, very, yeah, cool company. They do lots of cool stuff. No one's taken away from them, but for every brand that succeeded as the first mover, there's tons that have been just copycats. And they do really well. Think about Apple on how they're never a first mover in a lot of the advancements. When you think about like Android's yeah. always known, like really pushing that, pushing yeah. those barriers. But what Apple does is when they do integrate it, it works like flawlessly or it's yeah. refined to a way that they believe makes sense for their consumers. And on the one hand, it's like, yeah, there is important. And Nella talked about this. There is a first mover opportunity there, but quickly that erodes. Mm -hmm. And that's why it can't just be that mm -hmm. your only thing that you're really like hanging your entire strategy on mm -hmm. because your runway runs out a lot quicker than you think, especially there's, when competitors either think it's a great idea or yeah. they're just matching you. There's a guy from Calgary that started Groupon and I ended up going oh. to a talk not so long ago with him, the whole business model. And they, he had some investors from uh, somewhere in Europe. I want to say they're Germans. I don't know why, but anyway, th they, their whole business model was, Oh, we're going to see that idea over there. It was actually another company. I think it was called Groupon as well. And they just copied everything, <laughs> everything. And they just did it better. <laughs> like yeah. the logo, the colors, the, you know, the off the system, all that. They just did it better like not yeah. innovative in the way you think of like something brand new it was just like they just did it better and then he su succeeded like enormously with that product then he launched nd which was uh like one of those the mattress. mattress yeah and so they saw casper and they were okay we can do that here in canada we can figure that out faster one of the things they did better if i'm not i hope i'm not butchering this but they they bought the machine that rolls the mattresses and it, it was like a year and a half wait for Casper to buy one that they could have in Canada to roll the mattress. So they had a competitive advantage because they had a mattress roller and that's what made Andy oh so big. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So it was not like, you know, the Tesla idea where you're thinking, you know, this is 
groundbreaking, revolutionary. No one's ever done it before. Like there's a lot of companies that succeed with just copying the other things that are being done. Yeah. Or bringing them to other countries or you see that a lot. Like I, I, you totally. know this, but I, tr I travel to Greece very often and it's not very often. Actually, you see like either ideas, startups, or even companies that eventually come to Europe or Greece specifically that, it, you know, were born in North America. Mm -hmm. And it's just people being opportunist, opportunistic, new market, mm -hmm. they find totally. a niche and they just get after it. Totally. Speaking of which, yeah. can you say the goat chase profitability in Greek? That would be great. <laughs> oh man, how would I say that? Profitability to Kergos? <laughs> I would say... It could be Greeklish. No, no, Kinigise to Kerdos. I don't know why I love that so much. It's just so great. <laughs> oh, so great. Ah, the pamen na kinigis mo to kerdos. There we go. That's even better. Ah, is malaka a good word to say? That's like no. That... We could say malaka is pamen na kerdis mo to kerdos, which loosely translates. Let's go wankers. Let's go chase profitability. <laughs> so good. Oh. Sorry, everybody. Oh, that's all good. <laughs> or I'm, uh, you don't have to apologize to me, but anyone else. <laughs> yeah. I'm no, I apologize to everybody else. You asked for it, so here you yeah. go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, buddy. This was great. Awesome. Thanks again, Ella. Yeah, thanks, Ella. Okay, take care. <laughs>